This is Audible. Harper Audio presents By Myself, written and read by Lauren Bacall. All I had known of film was Betty Davis and Leslie Howard. I was in love with him. Alas, was never to meet him. She was my 15-year-old idea of perfection. Fine actress, dramatic bravery, doomed tragedy, sardonic wit, all an actress should be. And when I cut school, I would sit all day in a movie house, sobbing through Dark Victory or Jezebel or The Old Maid, smoking in the balcony. I paid for a whole package, so I had to finish it. Forbidden at home, of course. Getting sick on tobacco and sen-sen to get the stench out of my mouth so as to go undetected by Mother and Uncle Charlie. One morning, my uncle came in to kiss me goodbye before leaving for work and said, Have you been smoking? Shaking, I replied, Of course not. Whereupon he went into the next room to tell my mother he was certain I was smoking. Oh, God, would I survive this humiliation? Wouldn't I ever grow up, be on my own, free to do what I wished? Wouldn't I ever live alone? The purity of Jewish upbringing, the restrictions that one carried through life being a nice Jewish girl. What a burden. But if you were, and I was, you had it drummed into your head from childhood by your mother, grandmother, uncles, that nice Jewish girls didn't smoke, weren't fast. Nice Jewish girls had character. Don't chase a boy, ever. If he wants to see you, he'll call. If not, forget him. But what were you to do if your head was filled with dreams of beauty, glamour, romance, accomplishment, and if you were struck with being tall, ungainly? I didn't know I was cult-like until a critic said I was. With big feet, flat-chested, too young to have finished high school at 15, too inexperienced, shy, frightened to know what to do with a boy when I did have a date. If my dream would only come true, then I would know how to behave. Then things would fall into place, wouldn't they? Imagination is the highest kite that can fly. When you have nothing but dreams, that's all you think about, all that matters, all that takes you away from humdrummery. The fact that your mother was working too hard and didn't have enough in her own life, that your grandmother, loving though she was, wanted you to get a decent job to help your mother, that you didn't have enough money to do anything you wanted to do, even buy a lousy coat for seventeen ninety-five. Dreams were better. That was where my hope lay. I'd hang on to them, never let go. They were my own. It wasn't that I was deprived. We just had to live on a strict budget. No, it was that everything I fantasized about had nothing to do with everything I lived. Not a thing. Yet Mother gave me everything. Everything she could, and more. She was a decent, proud, honorable woman who, despite her struggles, never lost her sense of humor. She was not demonstrative, but I never doubted her love and her total dedication to me. She just wanted me to be perfect. She wanted me to have it all, but to know and to learn while the search was on, to realize that there were other things not to lose sight of. Mother left Romania by ship, aged somewhere between one and two, with her mother, father, older sister, baby brother. They arrived on Ellis Island and gave their name, Weinstein Bacall meaning wine glass in German and Russian. The man must have written down just the first half of the name, so it was Max and Sophie Weinstein, daughters Renee and Natalie, son Albert. Grandfather Max bought a candy store in a place called the Bronx and found a small apartment. Two more children, Charlie and Jack, were born in America. Grandma worked in the candy store. Renee, the eldest, helped after school. Natalie, my mother, was still too young. One afternoon, Grandpa went to a movie, came home, lay down for a while, and died. He was 55. All the children went to work at early ages, with Charlie and Jack going to night school at City College to get their law degrees. My mother worked as a secretary. She met my father, William Persky, who fell madly in love with her and showered her with attention. She was in her early 20s. Nice girls were married by then, said Grandma. So, out of a combination of fear of not doing the right thing and fear of him, she consented. From the start, Mother knew the marriage was a mistake. They didn't get along. There would be a divorce. I would live with her, but of course I would see him regularly. I was six years old. She never tried to turn me against my father, but she never thought or behaved like a martyr. Not her scene at all. 
She lost track of my father. He stopped his Sunday visits when I was eight. Of course I loved him. I guess I loved him. I was a little girl. He was my father. When they were divorced, my mother decided to take the second half of her name for her use and mine. So she became Natalie Bacall and I was Betty Bacall. Mother stood behind me all the way. If I wanted to be a dancer, an actress, that was what I would be if there was anything she could do about it. Through her belief in me and her abounding love for me, she convinced me that I could conquer the world, any part of it or all of it, whatever I wanted. She would help me, encourage me, while the rest of my family thought she was mad. Who had ever heard of an actress in the family? Grandma was horrified at the thought. A nice Jewish girl. Why didn't I make an honest living doing something she could understand? Why was my mother doing without to send me to dancing schools, dramatic schools? No good would come of it. In the worst of times, I never heard her complain. Whatever resentment she might have felt, whatever sadness for what she didn't have, she kept it all inside. I respected her, and I loved her. If she but held my hand, I felt safe. Mother and I moved to Manhattan after the divorce, and I recall little of any special home between the ages of six and ten. Mother started to work and hired a maid to come in so I wouldn't be alone when I returned from school. The girl she hired turned out to be slightly mad. She locked me in a closet one afternoon. That experience convinced Mother that the solution was for me to go to boarding school. There I would be safe from crazy maids. I'd be with girls my own age, not too far from home. Ideal. But it was expensive. Uncle Jack offered to lend her the money. So it was arranged I would attend the Highland Manor School for Girls in Tarrytown, New York. It was decided after my graduation from Highland Manor that I would go to high school in New York. Mother and I would live with my grandmother and Uncle Charlie and share the rent. I would go to Julia Richmond High School on 67th Street and 2nd Avenue. I remember those years of living with my grandmother. We had happy times. My grandmother cooking, singing me German songs, reading constantly in French, German, Russian, and English. I was her pet grandchild. I remember her telling me how I must always help my mother, how hard my mother worked. And then there was my Uncle Charlie, the man who surely had the most influence in my life through my growing up years. He told me I must read the New York Times every day, that as I was in high school now, I should learn what was going on in the world. How could I tell him that I only cared about my own world, the me that was going to be? I had two very close friends in high school. One was Sylvia Byrne, whose Russian grandmother served hot tea in a glass, Russian style, every time I was there. Then there was Betty Kalb. We shared the same dream, to become actresses. She wanted to be in films, I wanted to be on the stage. We were both mad about Betty Davis. We'd see her films, imitate her, play scenes word for word, look for look, step for step. I spent my last year in school filled with restlessness and frustration. I wanted to get on with real life, or away from real and on to pretend. If the sun was shining, I wanted to be outside. If it rained, I wanted to be watching a Betty Davis film. I was a good student, not summa cum laude, mind you, but able to get through well enough without too much effort. What mattered was that Saturday mornings I took classes at the New York School of the Theatre. Mother agreed that I could go, and that was what I got through the week for. There I had my first taste of improvisation, of memorizing scenes, playing parts of all ages. Oh, it was fun, but it was so short, only a few hours each week. Graduation at last, the end of school and the beginning of the pursuit of my destiny. Mother agreed that I should go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. It would be a struggle, but with the help of Jack and Charlie once more, it could be accomplished. The spring before high school ended, Betty Kalb and I had read that Betty Davis was coming to New York. She always stayed at the Gotham Hotel. Traveling with her was her friend Robin Byron, who also happened to be a friend of my Uncle Jack's. I called and asked him, begged him, to call Robin and try to arrange for me to meet my idol. Finally, my darling Uncle Jack called. He'd spoken with Robin, and though Miss Davis had a very busy schedule, Betty and I could come to her hotel on Saturday afternoon at four o'clock. Betty and I were hysterical. We spent hours on the phone. What would we wear? How would we do our hair? What would we say? 
We did our imitations of her walk, speech, to get that out of our systems at least. It was so exciting. The high point of my life. A dream come true. Saturday came. Mother and Grandma couldn't wait for it all to be over. They'd heard nothing but Betty Davis for days on end. Betty arrived to pick me up. We went to the hotel and were told to go right up. We grasped each other's hands, took deep breaths, checked our hair, and finally I pressed the doorbell. Robin ushered us into a living room. I was trembling from head to foot. At last the door to the bedroom opened and out walked Betty Davis with that Betty Davis walk. Queen of films, the best actress in the world. Oh, God. Betty Davis was open, direct, easy, and sympathetic. She asked us about ourselves, said she'd been told by Robin that I wanted to be an actress. In a voice barely audible, I said that I did, and that I'd been going to drama classes on Saturdays until I finished school. Betty Davis was very patient. She said, well, be sure it's really what you want to do with your life. It's hard work, and it's lonely. <laughs>